Hello all, I think I better start. <laughs> Next topic, last lecture today. My topic is the place of kink in psychotherapy and counseling training. And it is uh, so interesting, it's been so interesting for me also how much of this has been anticipated and how many parts of it already have appeared in earlier talks today. You see here a few sort of places where you can sort of find me, where you can uh, connect with me and I wanted to talk very much uh, given that I think it is already a big enough topic about kink in psychotherapy training and that means avoiding talking about psychotherapy itself and avoiding talking about kink itself. In terms of sort of anticipation and just to mention that uh, there was the brilliant talk from DK and what DK was talking about really um, was already a part of what could appear in psychotherapy training as far as I can see and there are several things that DK sort of highlighted that you see coming back in my talk and then there was uh, Christina uh, but also Olivier who spoke um, fairly extensively about the question of the definition of sexualities and that will come back so I will not in my talk to really refer to them and draw the parallels but you will no doubt have it in mind Final thing I want to say is that I tried to talk for about 20-25 minutes, leaving a lot of space for questions and discussions. I'd almost thought of making it completely free-floating and doing it bit by bit, but that is too difficult to manage. So there is a first 20-25 minutes that I will be talking about it. Um, what I've also done is I've sort of seen it as a little bit of a challenge. I mean, the greatest dream I would have is if there would be a head of a training committee of an training organization here in the UK who would be sort of sitting here in the audience who had been thinking already about how to introduce kink in their curriculum and who would then sort of say I thought that I wanted to do it but it can't be done because it is too difficult and I've tried to in a way provide a bit of proof that it could be done that it can be done and I've got a handout here that has quite a bit of bibliography that shows sources and possibilities um, organized in the same way as in my talk that in my view sort of shows that it is possible to do that that you can just go ahead and do it now and where it becomes interesting is that of course there is some talk about some parts of kink but that is mostly done in psychoanalytic quarters and mostly about kink as a perversion and that I think is the kind of thing that we want to change and that many of us here, most of us here have already changed to say sort of kink is not pathological, it is not a perversion. It is a value neutral common human set of activities, practices and attitudes. Anyway, I've made sort of four headings that I see as possible headings of a curriculum, a training curriculum. The first one had to do with sort of what is kink. A second area is then positioning kink. And positioning kink in a curriculum would be about a historical, culture, interdisciplinary positioning. I think there are a number of special issues that would be dealt with when you teach kink in a psychotherapy curriculum. And fourthly, I believe that kink and the knowledge and experience of kink could make a major contribution to psychotherapy and that ought to be brought out. A starting point that would need to be there in the program is this whole question, what is kink, is of course the basics of kink explaining that. I think that will be important in a curriculum because you would expect to have quite a few trainees who have no experience of kink at all or possibly only indulge in one or two activities and they need to be told what there is, what people do, what a range of sort of human experience and activity is. But fundamentally this is not uh, a difficult thing to do. There are by now quite a few good introductions to kink so in some way to put that into a curriculum should not be a problem. But uh, it gets more interesting with this question of depathologizing kink and um, what that means, what that implies. Now, I think that that basically means that firstly you start saying that nothing that is kinky, whether it is behavior, activity, state, a relationship, identity, is pathological or disordered and hence that if you work with people, if you diagnose, or if you see problems or um, maybe mental disorders or pathology, if that is part of your vocabulary, that you then assume that that is not caused by kink. 
and of course, and again, particularly Christina spoke about that, kink can be non-consensual, it can involve illegal activity, and it can in a way be an expression of other problems. That's not central, it is not to be expected. Now, if you say that kink is not pathological, that it is not a perversion, you really need another concept. And there I want to jump, as again Christina has already done, and Olivier, to sexuality. And in my own way, but very briefly, um, review, repeat, that there has been a big development. You see there at the bottom, the narrowly defined concept of sexuality that over the ages and particularly churches have always tried to say that sexuality is restricted to something that has a natural reproductive purpose. But I think that clearly has failed. And since then, since those days, there has been a gradual sort of expanding, growing of that oval into an expanded sexuality concept with lots and lots of things in it. Now there has been a very long battle that needed to be fought 100 to 150 years long, simply about including masturbation. Um, and that needed to be normalized, where also sex educators and sex therapists played a big role in that. That is more or less gone now. Um, but there are uh, many other uh, aspects that still are being discussed and that some people are still, I think, confused about. Um, whether orgasms are vital or the main purpose of sexuality. Uh, questions of believing that penetration or genitalia are very important. Um, that it all needs to be physical rather than that you can have sexuality with a mind only. Cyberspace, virtual sex, fantasy, uh, sexuality limited to a particular kind of relationship and um, whether sex need to be traditional sex or whether you can say, as Olivier said this morning, asexuality is also part of a person's sexuality and sexual choices. Now in this very general expanded category where you say that sexuality can be for reproduction as much as for pleasure, fulfillment or actualization or other purposes, I believe that that is where kink fits in and that is where you get the alternative concept for kink and that answers in my view the question if kink is not a perversion, what is it? It is part of the wide extended concept of sexuality. And that needs to be developed, that needs to be run through in a curriculum. <coughs> what also nicely illustrates this is Franklin Vaux who already came up with a different map and Franklin Vaux has made a map of the lens of human sexuality, which is available in various forms on the internet, and many of you may know it already, uh, which is absolutely beautiful and has all kinds of sex on it. Unfortunately, the detail here is too detailed in terms of the slide for you to see it, so I thought I'd just sort of here give a bit more sort of profile where you can see that right in the middle of that, of course, you have a number of rather kinky activities. So for Franklin Vaux also, it is simply an integral part of the whole world of uh, human sexuality. And as a uh, teaching tool, a pedagogical tool, uh, I think this map would be really useful. Uh, another sort of argument that I would have sort of historically for placing kink in this way and treating it in a curriculum is that at the start of official <laughs> sexology, at the end of the 19th century, really about the same thing happened. A number of those pioneers then tried to look and they made, which for that time was fairly understandable, the distinction between natural and unnatural sexuality, because that was very much done in the 19th century, always trying to see what's natural and what is unnatural. And then that unnatural sexuality uh, rapidly was renamed as perversion, and that is where that whole sort of movement has come from. Nowadays, we more or less say that the distinction of natural and unnatural for human activity in general is pretty useless, but at least it was also the pioneering sexologists then who did say that even though it might have been unnatural, it was sexuality. And that leads, I think, logically to my second point about the positioning of kink. 
Now, I think a historical grounding is very important. And again, sort of <laughs> preceded by Christina, there is a long history. And I think that would be very useful in a teaching program to bring that out. Um, a kink is, as one could expect, as old as humanity. I mean, you have the, the spanking chapter in the Kama Sutra. Um, there were the old uh, Greek playwrights, Aristophanes and Meander, who gave a great place to sort of shit eating. Uh, if you then skip a little bit and only take basically Western developments, you had in the Middle Ages Boccaccio's Decameron, which had a lot of kink in it. Then you got into the first Western erotic books, L'Ecole des Filles in around 1650 in France, and Fanny Hill in the UK around 1750. And they had substantial amounts of kinky scenes and kinky activity in it. And all the literature after that, between sort of then and now, is too much to even sort of say something about it. But there was also the Marquis de Sade, who had a very wide range of kinky activity. And he did not only sort of give his name to uh, sadism, uh, but genuinely in his books, there was a lot to think about. Formal sexology, of course, started later, possibly dated to Kraft Ebing in 1886. Um, and I think that this kind of summary of the history of kink and the history of sexuality would need to be part of a program. Sometimes people, I think, have a simple picture in their mind. They say around the 1970s, after quite a battle, homosexuality was removed as a pathological diagnosis from the DSM. And we are now a little bit later, and the same needs to happen with kink and everything will be fine. I think that's a little bit simplistic, because there is a much longer history before there was the issue about diagnosing for a considerable time being gay as pathology, there was the association between masturbation and mental illness, which was genuinely held for 50, 70, 80 years. And part of the battle of normalizing masturbation also meant severing that link. And even before that, you had in the Middle Ages all the talk about sodomy. And sodomy leads to some confusion because that has other more limited meanings. But the technical meaning in the Middle Ages of sodomy really covered the whole range of kink and not only anal sex. And that was then a major category. And that is one more item that I think should be an essential part of a curriculum that when we talk about depathologizing kink, that it is not a kind of gratuitous, progressive, politically correct thing to do, but that these were and are matters of life and death. In the Middle Ages, when you had that category of sodomy, people were executed for it. The Cathars in the 13th century were amongst the most viciously persecuted group by the church, and that was partly because they believed in sexuality for pleasure and not sexuality for reproduction. Witch trials were uh, substantially also based on the sexual behavior as one of the points of accusation. Today, homosexuality is still a capital crime in many countries. Trans people are killed ongoingly in the USA for being trans. So it remains true that kink is dangerous, controversial, taboo, and persecuted. And then finally, last but not least, but very sort of close to home here, much of BDSM in England and Wales is still technically subject to criminal prosecution, even if consensual. This needs to be explained in training. It needs to be brought out because People outside the community would not realize it, would never have heard of it, need to be told. Uh, the cultural side, cultural positioning of kink is also very important because obviously kink and what kink is, is culturally influenced. I think most of us would be quite aware of the different sensitivity and feel and words and all that simply between the United States and the UK. Um, but it is much wider sort of around the world. Um, there's no time for that today, but it would need to get some shape in a <coughs> curriculum, I think. What is also important, though, is that both kink and sexuality, and of course for understandable reasons when you put kink as part of extended sexuality, 
that they are clearly interdisciplinary. And the fact that they are interdisciplinary means that other disciplines take an interest. Now the good bit about that is that no one has sole authority over kink and what kink is. But these other groups, religion, law, feminism, medicine, they all would like to have authority over kink. They would like to police it. They would like to define the boundaries as they see it. So depathologizing kink as a category in the DSM or in a thinking about it or in what is being taught in a psychotherapy curriculum is not the only thing that's necessary. And as part of that attempt <coughs> to um, own kink and talk about it and define that that other disciplines have, uh, which is partly of course influenced by the aim to make anxious and ignorant people feel safer, uh, the role for the psychotherapist can only be to be neutral. But clients will often come in with boundary issues or boundary conflict. Boundaries because they run into the boundaries of kink and definitions and ideas about kink that come from one of these other areas, from the law, from medicine, from feminism, from religion. And of course also from popular culture and the media. But no one owns this and it needs to be seen in an open way. Now in terms of specific issues, I have highlighted here three, but this is one of the things where I hope that in the discussion to sort of get some response from you, uh, whether you think there are others that are equally or more important or whether you think that one of these is not important enough to be there. I had here consent, the meaning of involvement and the questions of risk and harm. Now consent, both consent itself and the nature and type of consent are I think very, very important for kink and for a kink curriculum. And there is, of course, as most of you will know, um, a lot that has happened on that uh, in the fairly recent past 10, 15 years, partly by influences that come from feminism, but even more also out of the daily practice of kink and BDSM. Um, there are new ideas about what you can expect of consent uh, that have been coming up. Uh, it hasn't got, I think, a fixed name yet. Uh, sometimes meaningful consent is tried or affirmative consent or enthusiastic consent, but there is a clear idea that you do need to specify it, you need, do need to uh, think about that. Uh, there isn't, I think, really authoritative material, sort of complete books that fully treat this that are satisfactory. But I think there is again enough in this area so that it can have the place and training that it should have. And again in my handout I've tried to demonstrate that with sort of a good series of uh, partly references to blogs and articles on the <laughs> internet that all together provide a real body about what is necessary here because consent is central in kink and is very important. And the point will also need to be made that consent is not unique to kink because there is in fact more experience in kink communities about consent and thinking about consent than where perhaps it is even more needed that is in straight vanilla sex. And again this is one of those points where you would see the training turning around and saying you sort of have a body of opinion, body of ideas here but it has a wider import, a wider interest for uh, therapists and counselors in training. Mm. The uh, second specific issue is the question of um, what a kink means for a person. And that I think is a quintessential thing that comes up and comes up naturally in a lot of therapeutic contact because you have a whole range there from it is part of lifestyle or identity um, towards maybe saying it is part of someone's personality, it is someone's behavior actions, or someone holds it as a little spicing up of her sex life in some of these kind of sort of rather diminutive words. And again, Christina used the, the sort of the, the simple uh, distinction here between sort of identity and practice. But this whole area sort of is there, is important, is relevant. And I think that the difference between um, the different possible meanings that kink can have for an individual person is in themselves sort of quite neutral, so there's nothing right or wrong about it, whether it is part of someone's identity or whether it's only part of their occasional behavior or even sort of a minor part of it. 
uh, but it does make a difference when you speak with someone and when it does come up to know and be aware and to place where it is on this scale. Then there's the question of risk and harm and uh, there is of course the um, evolution that there has been from the earlier slogan of safe, sane and consensual, where the safe in safe, sane and consensual, where the <laughs> safe in <laughs> safe, sane and consensual um, seem to suggest um, that safe is there as a kind of an absolute possibility. Well, we know there are no sort of human activities that are riskless. And then RAC, R-A-C-K, risk where consensual kink is probably a much better slogan. And the question can, of course, be asked when um, you have meaningful informed consent, how can you possibly object to kinky activities in a society where you have mountain climbing and boxing and car racing and lots and lots of other risky activities that people sort of love and applaud and sort of show on television? Where is this sort of deep, sort of bad feeling about kink always coming from? Danger and harm. Um, are essential part of kink and so is the thrill of the transgressive. Now it is not only violence that plays a role there but also um, more subtle things, objectification, uh, played coercion, subtle uses of power and it can be either in fantasy and role play or more directly in practice. Some people say even like to sort of claim that power exchange is part of the fundamental definition of kink. Whatever that may be, these are the three issues, the three topics that I think should need extensive uh, treatment in a training curriculum for kink. Then there is this question of the contribution that kink can make to psychotherapy. And um, the first area where I see this is in enhancing the therapeutic relationship. We all know, see, are aware of the therapeutic relationship being sort of one of the most essential um, factors for the effectiveness of therapy. Now, the therapeutic relationship is already conventionally very often compared with other relationships. With a parent-child relationship, the whole sort of psychoanalytic concept of regression is based on that. Uh, comparisons with the drama triangle of Karpman, the persecutor, victim, rescuer position and saying sort of do some of the positions of this triangle, are they being replayed in therapy and if that is, should we notice it, should we talk about it, what does it mean? Um, and there are other comparisons too. Um, a comparison that is less often made is a comparison between therapy and sex work, uh, with of course a therapist in the sex worker position because the, sec because the therapist gets paid. Uh, that's possibly rarely done for that reason, but it is a valid comparison that would bring out uh, certain aspects of it. And you can compare it with the teacher-student uh, roles and with a married couple if you believe in a more egalitarian sort of position that at some stage could develop in therapy. So all those comparisons are there, but if you now look at sort of kink, there's an enormous world there of dom-sub, the S relationships. And the game that came up in a slightly different sort of way sort of in, in the case talk, in my view, the knowledge, the understanding, both the practice and the theory of DS relationships and how they work and what is good and bad and what that means for people um, can also be seen as a possible metaphor and analogy for things that may happen for better or for worse in a therapeutic relationship. Um, that is, I think, one wide area, but then there are other things, the consent model, as I said already, negotiating a scene, contracting, um, they are relevant concepts for therapy. And um, again, what came up earlier today, the possibility that people of their own accord are trying to find meaning in experiences they have had in the past that can involve abuse, violence, punishment or coercion by parts of their kinky activities. There are obvious dangers when that is happening, but in any case, this needs to be centrally and clearly dealt with, in my view, for trainee therapists and counselors, because if people come in and they did something kinky, and it is there because it brought up the past and they have difficult emotions with that, 
then the counselor, the therapist, needs to find a sensible way of dealing with that and be prepared for that and have thought through how to deal with that, how to put it, and what to make of it. Now, that was the four headings I really had, and I want to come to a conclusion now and speak about one bigger thing, and that is that historians and sociologists have already done a lot of work about um, how to respond to certain big noticeable forms of activity that are somewhat controversial and how those responses can shift over time and between societies. And I like you when you sort of see this in the different colors, first to look a little bit to um, addiction or alcoholism and to the colloquial idea of madness. Now historically there have been times that um, culture, society, people were seeing that mostly as a problem to do with uh, spirits and possession. When institutional religion came up, religion tried to get hold of that, mostly classified what was unusual and disturbing as sin. Um, when the state started to come up in modern times, the state tried to get hold of this authority from religion and classify it as crime. And said this is a crime, it needs to be punished, people need to take responsibility for what they do. Addiction, madness and a number of other activities. In more humanitarian sort of times, 19th, 20th century, people with the doctors in the lead started to say of certain activities, oh, but this is not a crime, people are not fully responsible for it, this is a disease that they can't help, they need to be treated for it. And it is in that area that, again, you had, of course, addiction and mental illness treated. But now, more recently, there is a number of other classes of ways in which unusual behavior can be seen. Um, the rather elusive category of performativity, um, trademarked by Judith Butler, but also the idea of diversity. And then when you talk about the unusual behavior represented by the autism spectrum, yeah, there is now the language of neurotypical and neurodiverse and say this is fine and this is neurodiverse and even when you can classify or as one did autism as a mental illness that is now transiting towards saying it is a question of diversity and if it is diversity you don't need to be treated for it you need to sort of take care of it and be able to work around it and work with it and accept that this is how it is and then there is the even larger and still rather different profile of course Pink therapy stands very much for diversity, but to say we are all human, or alternatively, if you like, we are all animals, that is still slightly different from saying this is all about diversity because diversity suggests that those diversities need to be dealt with, that there is a problem. We are all human is even, I think, a slightly different nuance. And it is on this line that I think King also should have a place and a position and that a fully non-pathological, nothing to do with problems or perversions concept of King should get a place in the future uh, in therapy training. So my final conclusion is maybe we can on this point leave the crab bucket and start crawling onto the table because I don't think that there is probably any example of a non-pathological concept of kink being included as part of a training curriculum. And I hope that we do more in this discussion and that we all sort of go away from here and start thinking about when in the next sort of 5, 10, 15 years is some training institute going to like it and to dare to put this on the table. And in the meantime, can we start thinking out further and in more detail sort of what the point should be and what the curriculum should be. And I have my handout for you and also a digital copy for it. And some of the books in the handout I have sort of lying here if you want to uh, look at them later. Thank you very much. Thank you.